Good morning viewers. Welcome to Elim TV Live. Today I want to teach science lesson, a standard six lesson under health education. And we want to learn about common communicable diseases. So every Thursday, as you know, we always come and interact with you and we take you under science lesson. So today I'm privileged to take you under this topic called health education. So the topic today, the subject is science. For those who don't know me, I'm not new here. I'm teacher Edwin Yose. I'm a teacher by profession, and I teach at a school called Katsam School. So welcome, and I hope if you have got any question, by the end of this session, you can send your questions as I teach, and I'll go through them. So today, I want to teach about health education, health education, and it is a standard six work that I want to take you through so that they cannot be left behind even as class eights are in school. And the subtopic will be common communicable diseases, common communicable diseases. Before I take you through this topic, I want to bring a recap of what we learned about health education in other classes. In standard one, under health education, we learned about personal items. The personal items you are told in grade one, right now it is called grade one, they are not supposed to be shared. According to the primary syllabus, the school syllabus, we learn the personal items include something like socks, they have placed there something like vest. They have placed there something like toothpaste, tooth, toothbrush. A toothbrush, toothpaste is not a personal item. And surprisingly, in the syllabus, we don't have something called a towel. So we realize that a towel and the undergarments known as pants, they're not in the syllabus. So a towel is not a personal item. Because if you go to the hotels, you can find, you can share this towel. So that's why it is not there. In standard two, under personal items, they learned about personal hygiene. And under hygiene, they were teaching about, or they reminded the learners how to clean what we call a water closet. In the syllabus, they've written WC, which means water closet. Water closet is the other name for toilet. In grade two, again, and the when you're cleaning the water closet, they told you you're supposed to use water and we use something called disinfectant. Disinfectant is something like HAPIC. They also taught about how to clean something called latrines. Latrines are commonly found in rural areas. And when you're cleaning latrines, we use water and ash. In grade three, under health education, standard three, they taught about requirements for good health. The requirements for good health. And under requirements for good health, there are some things that we are supposed to discuss there for good health. And one, we had got something called food. Food is required for good health. Number two, Exercise is required for good health. Number three, I have not written the word exercise properly. Exercise is good for your health. Number four, there is something called medis medicine. You are supposed to take some medicines or medical care. When you are sick, you are supposed to visit the doctor and they told you a person who takes care of the eyes, we call them optician. A person who takes care of the teeth, dentist. And then another requirement for good health is what we call rest. And in the syllabus, they have highlighted there that the best medicine after hard work is what we call rest. There are many, 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 but I'm just highlighting a few. In standard four under health education, 
we learned about problems related to teeth. The problems related to teeth, problems related to teeth, and the first problem related to teeth was gum disease. Gum disease is also known as gingivitis or gingivitis. It is also known as bleeding gums, or in some books they place there the word scurvy, because lack of vitamin C, it causes scurvy, and this brings what we call bleeding gums. Another problem related to teeth, it was tooth cavity. A cavity is a hole that is found in the tooth. Another problem there that we learned, it was about tooth decay, tooth decay. And then lastly, you learned about something called bad smell or bad breath. Under the same, same topic, they introduced what we call HIV and AIDS, the meaning of HIV and AIDS. In grade five, they continued with the same, same topic, HIV and AIDS, and they took you under the stages of HIV infection. So in standard five, under this topic, Nini Health Education, they taught about the stages of HIV infection. Stages of HIV infection. And they just say, will I stay forever? You find the stages of HIV infection. We have got the window stage, which is the first one, and it is the most deceptive stage of HIV infection. And it is the only stage when you are tested, you appear to be negative. We have got incubation stage, which takes the longest period of time. And this incubation stage, when you are tested, the results are positive. Incubation stage is also known as a symptomatic stage. We have got another stage known as symptomatic stage. Symptomatic stage is where the signs and symptoms begin to symptomatic stage, symptomatic. Okay. Symptomatic stage is where the signs and symptoms uh, begin to appear, and it is where a person is attacked by opportunistic diseases. So here, again, when you are tested, the results are positive. And then the last stage, you have got full-blown. Now in class six, where I am right now, in standard six under health education, we shall now learn about we learn about something called immuni immunizable diseases, immunizable diseases, and then we look at something called immunization schedule. The diseases that an infant is immunized against since at birth up to nine months. And then we also learn about communicable or common communicable diseases. And this is where I really want to focus for today. So I have brought you up to, to a place where I am supposed to begin from. And I believe, as I talk about this topic, we can recall what we learned from other classes. Because in science, they link up everything together. So today, we want to look at this thing known as common communicable diseases. So the first question arises, what are communicable diseases? In social study, you learn about means of communication. And you learn communication is the passing of information from one person to another. Or you send a sender when he, he takes it to the receiver. That is what you say you have passed information. So the word communicable, communicable comes from the word communicate. So in short form, communicable diseases, communicable diseases, these are diseases that can be transmitted or can be passed from one person to another. So communicable diseases are diseases that are easily transmitted, that are easily transmitted, transmitted from one person to another, from one person to another. And right now, as I, t I teach this topic, you can realize the country is under this pandemic known as COVID, COVID-19. 
uh, although it is not in the syllabus, and you can see it can pass from one person to another. That's why they carry out what we call contact tracing. So to transmit is the same as to pass. It means it can be passed from one person to another. So communicable disease is also known as also known as infectious diseases because you'll become infected once you come into contact with somebody that has it. So if they ask the other name for communicable disease, we have got what we call infectious diseases. Now, these diseases can be passed from one person to another. So because you can get it, there are some ways that you can get these diseases. So they can pass from one person to another, mainly through, so can be passed from me if I have it, can be passed from one person to another. One person to another. Through, there are many ways through which you can get them. One, these communicable diseases, you can get them through air, when you inhale contaminated air, you can get it. That's why right now they're instructing us to use what we call mask because you can get a certain communicable disease. Number two, you can, it can be passed from one person to another through what we call contacts. That's why we have got what we call contact tracing. I enjoy now teaching this one because now everybody is aware about what? Corona. And then we have got another way that you can get this disease is through vectors. I will explain later what vectors are. Another one, you can get this disease through taking contaminated water. Contaminated water. Under waterborne diseases, we have got cholera, we have got bilharzia and typhoid. And you can realize when, some, when there's a cholera outbreak, you can find one person if he has cholera. If he or she is not immunized, he can pass that disease to another person. That's why we say it is communicable. The other way of passing these diseases to another person is by eating what we call contaminated food. You can get this disease when you take or eat contaminated food. So the main way through which these diseases are transmitted the first one is air. We have got some diseases, we call them contagious diseases, but mostly we'll find they are communicable. So if you come to body contact with another person, you can get them. Vectors are some microorganisms that do what? They can transmit the disease. You will find something like a housefly, it is a vector. A mosquito can be a vector. So you can find it can transmit this disease to a healthy person. So today we want to look at examples of common communicable disease. Now let me look, highlight examples of common communicable diseases. Examples of common communicable diseases. So examples of these diseases here. The ones, there are many, 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 many. But we want to look at the main ones that are in the syllabus. Disease, we have what we call tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, in short form, you're allowed to write it. We call it malaria. We shall really focus there. Number three, we have got another communicable disease that is known as typhoid. Typhoid, as you know, it is a waterborne disease, and we also group it as communicable disease. And then lastly, number four, we have got another common communicable disease known as flu. Flu, I can place it, it is known as common cold. You will find some books, they call it influenza. They shorten the word flu to become influenza. So these ones are some of the common communicable diseases. But in primary science class six, 
we mainly focus on tuberculosis and malaria. It does not mean that we don't have other communicable diseases. So other communicable diseases that we shall not learn about them, but I want just to list them down. Other communicable diseases that we have. So other communicable diseases are, they are communicable that they are not common like these ones. One, we have got what we call cholera. Cholera is a communicable disease and it is only prevented when there is an outbreak. Because right now, we don't have the proper vaccine for cholera. We have got another common communicable, okay, another communicable disease known as ringworm. As you know, ringworm is a plant, and its habitat is the human body. So it comes into, when you come into body contact with somebody who has it, you can get the disease. Number three, we have got what we call measles. Under immunization schedule, in class six, you learn that measles is immunized at the age of nine months. Measles is also known as school going disease or childhood disease. If a child is not immunized against this disease and he goes into contact with other people, he can get it. And then we have got another one known as smallpox. Smallpox, it is communicable. And then lastly, I can write there mumps. Mumps is also example of a communicable disease. There are many, 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 but let me not forget to write this one known as yellow fever. Yellow fever, as you know, it is a traveler's disease. If you go to another country, you are supposed to be immunized against this yellow fever. And then there is a book that even they write a whooping cough is also example of a communicable disease. So the most, the most common communicable diseases that we have, they are these four here. But we have got other communicable diseases Although they are part of this, but the majority that surround us, one is tuberculosis, and then two is malaria. Remember, malaria is declared as a national disaster, and mostly it affects, it is very common in Africa. That's why we are supposed to learn about it, and then tuberculosis. So allow me to begin by looking at this first disease known as malaria. The name sounds familiar. But this malaria, it has got many signs with other diseases. And most of the times we make a mistake. When you have a fever, you just tend to realize that or you just ignore and say that you have malaria. And maybe it is a symptom of another disease. So malaria itself is caused by, malaria is caused by plasmodium parasite. It is caused by a, a parasite known as plasmodium parasite. Plasmodium parasite. The other name for plasmodium parasite, it is also known as malaria parasite. If you don't find in exam, they have written the word plasmodium parasite, but they have written there this one known as malaria parasite. They mean the same thing. So malaria is caused by plasmodium parasite. The other name for plasmodium parasite, we call it malaria parasite. Most of the learners, you make a mistake by saying malaria is caused by a mosquito. There's difference between caused and then transmitted or spread. So the causative agent of malaria, we call it plasmodium parasite or malaria parasite. And this malaria, when somebody gets it, it can be spread from one person to another. We know there are some mosquitoes. We have different types of mosquitoes. We learned about, we have got this one known as anopheles mosquitoes. We have one that cause elef elephantitis, we call them Aedes mosquitoes. We have got others that cause yellow fever, we call them Calex mosquitoes. So we have got different types of mosquitoes. But when you come to malaria, we are focusing on this one known as Anopheles mosquito. So it is caused by Plasmodium parasite. Now it is spread to another person. It is spread to another person by now what we call a female anopheles mosquito. Not a male one, but what? A female one. So it is the female anopheles mosquito that spreads this what disease. Why? Because it uses the blood in the formation of the eggs. 
in the life cycle of this mosquito, when it wants to hatch the eggs, it requires some blood. That's why when a, a male Amnophilus mosquito comes and sucks your blood, you cannot get malaria. But the female one is the one that spreads this disease. I believe I am now there. Okay. So this malaria parasite, this plasmodium parasite here, the plasmodium parasite that is found in female Anopheles mosquito, it feeds on parts of the body. In class 7, you shall learn about the, the blood components. So you have got the red blood cells, we have got the white blood cells, we have got the blood platelets, blood platelets, and then we also have got something, okay, red blood cell, formation of oxygen, we have got hemoglobin there, white blood cells, we have got platelets, okay. So you'll find among these that I have listed here, this plasmodium parasite, it attacks one of it. So the plasmodium parasite attacks the red blood cell. Plasmodium parasite. Attacks the red blood cells. It feeds on the red blood cells. Rather than other diseases which attack the white blood cell, malaria parasite feeds or attacks the red blood cells. Why does it attack the red blood cells? At our level in primary, we should just know that red blood cell has got the red coloring pigment known as hemoglobin. This hemoglobin is the one that assists in transporting oxygen. So, and because this female anopheles mosquito wants to make its eggs, to form them, they can use that blood which is rich in oxygen so that they can make it. Mm -hmm. And then I promised I will teach something about vector. I said we have got one of the communicable diseases, ways that they can be passed, it is through vectors. So what is a vector? A vector is a carrier of disease causing germs. A vector is a carrier of disease causing germs. So why have, I, why have I placed it here? I have placed it here because mosquito is one of the vectors. So examples of vectors, anything that is a carrier, you can see when you look at a housefly, a housefly is a vector because you can get a, any cholera from it. A cockroach is a vector. Mosquito here is a vector because you'll find this, what we call this parasite here inside the female Anopheles mosquito. So those are what I can highlight there. Now allow me to look at the signs and symptoms of malaria. How can you tell that you have malaria? And how can you tell this is not malaria? Remember, the symptoms of malaria and typhoid, they appear similar. But we have got different symptoms that can tell if you have malaria or not. So let us look at the signs and symptoms of malaria. First of all, I would like to look at, to tell you the difference between sign and symptom. Allow me to write signs, signs and symptoms. The first thing we want to look at what we call the sign. Sign is what you do at, you see. There's difference between signs and symptoms. Sign is what you see. When you're traveling, there's something called the road signs. You can see a road sign somewhere, you know there is bum ahead. You can see a road sign somewhere, you can see it is a narrow, a narrow road or a narrow bridge. So whatever you see with your visible eyes, that is a sign. I believe you can see somebody vomiting, that one is a sign. You can see somebody sweating, it is a sign. You can see somebody very weak or emaciated or thin, that one is a sign. When we come to symptoms, symptoms are those things that we feel. So what do you feel when you are sick? That is now what we refer to as symptoms. So when they say signs and symptoms, they place them together. So you can feel you have got what? You have, your body is weak, general body weakness, that one is a symptom. You can feel a headache. When you tell somebody you have a headache, 
That person cannot tell by looking at your eyes. But you yourself, you can feel the head aching. When you have a stomach ache, that is a symptom. So we have got signs, and then you have got symptoms there. So I can now look at the signs and symptoms of malaria. How can you tell that you have malaria? Now, one of the signs and symptoms of malaria, and I believe when I list them, you can now differentiate if it is a symptom or a sign. So the first one, I believe it is a symptom, it is pains in the joints. Pains in the joints. Pains, joint pains. You can feel your, your joints are very weak, or when you are walking, you, you feel that there is some pain there. You can know that that one is a sign of malaria. But remember, you are not a doctor. You are supposed to go to the hospital to know if it is the sign of malaria or not. Number two, another sign and symptom, we have headache. Headache, if you have headache, it can be a sign of malaria. Number three, another sign and symptom of malaria. We have got what we call tiredness and the body weakness. You can become tired. Tiredness and body weakness. Number four, another sign and symptom of malaria. We have got what we call mild diarrhea. I'm writing the word mild diarrhea because you have got a certain disease that somebody has got violent diarrhea and that is cholera. So under this one, you can realize it can be small, minimal. It can be minimal or absent. So that's why we call it a mild diarrhea. Number five, another sign and symptom of malaria. We have got what we call vomiting. You eat something you vomit it. And remember, vomiting, it causes what we call dehydration. Vomiting and diarrhea, you lose a lot of water. In short, dehydration is when you lose a lot of water in the body through vomiting and diarrhea. Number six, you lack what we call appetite. So we have loss of appetite. Loss of appetite. Another sign and symptom of malaria, which is number seven, I have fever. Fever. Fever is a sudden rise in temperature, but nowadays you are not lucky. You can have fever, and then the doctors, they can realize before they diagnose you, they think that you have what we call corona. So it is one of these signs, but it's okay. Number eight, you can have bitter taste in the mouth. Your mouth, when you taste something, you feel it is bitter, bitter taste in the mouth. And when something becomes bitter, I believe you'll side with me, you will lose what we call appetite because there's nothing that can do it. Test it, test in your mouth very well. So when you eat something, you feel like vomiting. And then you have got number nine, lack of enough blood. In primary science, they have written lack of enough blood, lack of enough blood. And lack of enough blood, which may cause anemia. Which may cause anemia. We know anemia is a nutritional deficiency disease, which is caused by lack of something called iron. But even because these plasmodium parasites, they feed on your red blood cells, you can lack enough blood. So it can be a sign of what we call malaria. And then another sign and symptom, we have got sweating. You sweat. It can be during the day or at night. But we know when you sweat at night, mostly, probability of sweating at night, it will be tuberculosis. And then the last one is shivering. So number 11, another sign and symptom of malaria is what we call shivering. So we, when you have these signs and symptoms, you know you can be having this disease with you. You are supposed to go and seek medical attention at the nearby hospital. So if I want to differentiate between the signs and symptoms, pain in the joints, that one is what you feel, so this one is a symptom. Headache is a symptom. 
Nobody can see it. You are the only one who is feeling it. Tiredness and body weakness, it is a symptom. Diarrhea, that one is a sign because somebody can see. Vomiting is a sign. Loss of appetite is a symptom. Fever is a symptom. Bitter taste in the mouth, it is what? A symptom because you are the one who feels that you don't have that taste. Lack of enough blood, which may cause anemia, we can group it as a sign because somebody can see by, at your nails, your palm, or palms, or even your eyes. Sweating, it is a sign. Shivering is a sign. Now let us look at ways of doing what? Preventing malaria. Preventive measures. How can we prevent this malaria? Ways of preventing malaria. Ways of preventing malaria. So the preventive measures, how can you prevent malaria? How can you prevent it? Mostly, you, are, you can realize that when somebody is expectant, when he or she visits a nearby dispensary or any hospital, they are given what we call a mosquito net. So it is a preventive measure. So the government even tries its level best to try. The best way of preventing malaria, I'll begin with it. It is destroying the breeding sites. Destroying the breeding sites. This one simply means when we have got tall bushes and grasses near, nearby, you can do what you can go and cut them. When we have got some stagnant water near your houses, you are supposed to drain them. When there are some empty or cracked pots there, you are supposed to do what? To remove them because it is a breeding site for malaria. Number two, draining of stagnant water in the compound. Draining stagnant water. The two diseases that can be prevented by draining stagnant water, we have bilharzia and malaria. We know the mosquito larva, they are found on top of the water. So when you drain it, the mosquito larva will suffocate and they will die. So when you drain, you have killed the life cycle of those mosquitoes. Number three, we have got sleeping under a treated mosquito net. The mosquito net should be treated sleeping under a treated mosquito net. The key word there is supposed to be treated. So the mosquito net that we are using, ensure it is treated. Number four, you clear any vegetation around the homestead. Clear any vegetation around the homestead. around the homestead. I have not said you clear the vegetation cover. I have not said you go and cut. If you have planted maize, you clear all the maize plantation. You go and clear that vegetation that is unnecessary. We are, I mean, tall grass. We have got bushes that are necessary. They can be the hideouts of this mosquito. So they can hatch their, their eggs and they can spread. So you clear any unnecessary vegetation cover. And then number five, you fit wire, fitting wires in your homes, fitting wires. We have got some places that will allow for ventilation. So you fix what we call wire mesh at the places of ventilation. There are some places in the house that we allow what we call fresh air to enter the house. So mosquitoes, because they are tiny in size, they can penetrate through it. But when you use a wire mesh that is small in size, it can discourage mosquitoes from entering into the room. Number six, another way of preventing this malaria, it is by spraying the house. Spraying the house using insecticides. Spraying the house or the houses using what we call insecticides. Using insecticides. And previously, uh, under health education, before we retained class five, they said 
the chemicals that are used to kill insects. Chemicals used to kill insects, we call them insecticides. In class four, nowadays it is known as grade four, the chemicals that are used to kill weeds or to control weeds, we call them herbicides. The chemicals that are used to kill worms, you are told they are known as nematocytes. The chem chemicals that are used to kill parasites. When we talk about parasites, I'm talking about a tick, a flea, external parasites. We call them acaricides. And we have got many, many, many more. We have got those ones that kill bacteria, we call them bacteria side. But these are the common ones that we learned in grade five and four. Now number seven, another way of preventing the spread of malaria is by covering the stagnant water with oil. You cover the stagnant water with oil. When you cover stagnant water with oil, we know oil floats in water. When it floats there, it suffocates the mosquito larva. And when it, they, they are being suffocated, they can do what? They tend to die, and the life cycle of those mosquitoes, they die. And then, number eight, another way of controlling mosquito, you can apply mosquito repellent. Applying mosquito repellent, or you can use what we call the mosquito jelly. There is a certain body oil. It is not a body oil, but it's used to control mosquito. You just apply on your body, it has got a nasty smell. When the mosquitoes come near you, they cannot do what? Suck your blood. And then lastly, another way of controlling this thing known as mosquito, it is by clear any vegetation cover and broken pots. Clear any vegetation cover, I had written it on number four, vegetation cover, and broken pieces of glasses and pots. Glasses and pots. Because when it rains, you will find that water settles in these broken pots, and because the, these mosquitoes are very cunning, they come and hatch eggs on top of that water, and you can find that the eggs will hatch, and the generation of the mosquitoes will continue. So you'll find, a point to note under this one, you realize that this malaria, there is no vaccine yet for malaria. That's why we don't, we don't have any what we call curative drugs here. We don't have any antibiotic for this one. So, so far, we don't have a vaccine. The way you can detect malaria, malaria is only detected through blood test. You cannot that one. Malaria is detected only, mainly through blood test. Detected through blood test. So when you have these signs and symptoms, it does not mean that you have malaria. You are supposed to go and take what we call blood test so that they can see if you are really suffering from malaria or not. Because in class six, again, underwaterborne disease, you realize that a disease called typhoid may have similar signs and symptoms like malaria. You will find you will vomit, you will have loss of appetite, something like that. So you are supposed to take a blood test, and then you do what? You know you have this, what we call malaria. So because of time, allow me to move very fast to another common communicable disease. And the second common communicable disease I want to look at is tuberculosis, popularly known as TB. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. I just want to write it as TB. Tuberculosis, one, it is caused by bacteria. Some people, they call it a bacterial infection, yes. It is caused by a bacteria. We have got many different diseases that are caused by bacteria. So TB is among them. 
and you realize when an infant is born at birth under immunization schedule, the infant is immunized against tuberculosis on the left lower arm. There is always a mark somewhere here, or some paper disappears. That one is a BCG vaccine. It was named after the scientists that discovered it, Bacilla, Palmete, and Guerina, BCG vaccine. It is used to control this disease called tuberculosis. So this tuberculosis is airborne. Mostly it is airborne. It is mainly transmitted through air. And because it is transmitted through air, it is just like corona. Corona is transmitted through air. That's why we're using mask. And then when you inhale it, because it is airborne, we inhale. It goes into the lungs. So we'll find this tuberculosis, it goes and affects the lungs. So the part of the body that it affects, it affects the lungs. The part of the body that malaria affects, we said it affects the red blood cell. Now, because this one is airborne, we inhale it. Gaseous exchange takes place in the alveoli. You will find it goes and attacks the lungs. And when it attacks the lungs, you have got some signs and symptoms that can do what? You can get them. So I want to look at modes of tuberculosis transmission, ways in which tuberculosis is transmitted. We have got some ways or modes through which you can get this TB. It is not only air, but the main one is air. One is inhaling contaminated air, so you can get it through contaminated air. Number two, you can get tuberculosis by sharing food with infected person. Sharing food with infected person. Sharing food with infected person. Number three, you can get tuberculosis by living in overcrowded places. When you go to crusades, where majority of the people are there, so if you live in a place that is overcrowded, when somebody has got this disease, you, it can be transmitted unto you. So you are supposed to take caution on that. Number four, even if you board a vehicle and it has overloaded, we have got a lot of people, some are seated, others are standing you can get this what we call tuberculosis. Another one is living in a poorly ventilated room. Living in a poorly ventilated room. Another way that you can get this tuberculosis is sharing personal effects. Sharing personal effects. And when I talk about personal effects, I talked in grade class one, grade one, there are some personal items. There is this one called handkerchief. You are not supposed to share something like a handkerchief. This personal effect here, when you share it, you can get tuberculosis. And then the last one, if you drink unboiled milk, drinking raw milk or unboiled milk, you can get what we call tuberculosis. This milk, it has got some two diseases. One is called brucella, but that one is not in the syllabus. Here we look at what we call tuberculosis. So when you milk a cow, you can take that milk, you do what? You boil it before you drink it. But if you drink direct, and maybe that cow has got some infection, you can get this tuberculosis. Allow me to rush through the signs and symptoms of TB. So the signs and symptoms. How can you know that you are suffering from tuberculosis? Signs and symptoms of tuberculosis. The first sign I can say you can have what we call chest pain. You will have pain in the chest. As we know, the lungs are located on the thorax, on the thorax part of our body. So because the lungs are found in the chest, you'll feel that there is something that is pinching your chest. Number two, you'll have what we call a back pain. Number three, we shall, you can have what we call dry and then frequent and prolonged cough. You will cough frequently. You, you cough and cough and cough. Even corona has got the same, same thing, issue. 
You can cough and cough and cough. The other one is blood in the sputum. Blood in sputum. When I talk about sputum, sputum is a mixture of saliva, mucus, and blood. So sputum is a mixture. A mixture of saliva, mucus, and blood. So when you hear the word sputum, most of the time when we cough near the neck, you can, you can remove something that is very strong like this. You only need to assess a sputum. So this sputum is mixed with saliva. It has got some mucari in it, and then it has got some blood in it. So that's why we say we have got blood in sputum. And then the other sign and symptom of TB, you have got sweating at night. You really sweat at night. Sweating at night. Number six, another sign and symptom is loss of weight over a short period of time. Loss of weight over a short period of time. Over a short period of time. And then another one is tiredness and becoming weak. You will become tired. You feel you are very tired. Remember even malaria, you, you saw there was tiredness somewhere. So these signs are somewhat similar, but you are supposed to be very keen on identifying which one is for malaria, which one is for tuberculosis, which one is for typhoid, or any other disease that you will learn in this class. So we have got tiredness and becoming weak. That is number seven, tiredness and becoming weak. Number eight, because it affects the lungs, you shall have what we call difficulties in breathing. In breathing. Number nine, because you are tired, your body becomes fatigued. You will have what we call fatigue. Fatigue. And then lastly, the voice becomes hoarse. Voice becomes hoarse. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of tuberculosis. And then because, okay, because there is blood that comes, let me not forget about that one, there is blood that comes from the sputum. This tuberculosis again, the skin, it makes the skin to become pale makes the skin, skin becomes pale. We know the word pale. Paleness means you have got, you're suffering from what we call anemia. So malaria, you can become pale. Uh, tuberculosis, you can become pale. And this paleness, you can identify them in your palm. My English teacher, the teacher of English told me, L is silent. So you can identify them in the palm or the fingernails. You can look at the fingernails and you see they are pale. Or you can look at the eyes. You can see that the eyes are somewhat whitish. And you know this person is really suffering from this disease known as tuberculosis. Now lastly, let me look at the prevention and control of tuberculosis. Ways of preventing this tuberculosis. Preventive measures. How can you control this TB? First of all, before I forget, tuberculosis does, tuberculosis, these common communicable diseases, they don't have an edge of the person they attack. They can attack anybody, be it an infant with a baby, be it an old person, anyone can get these diseases. So one of the preventive measures is, and it is the best one, is taking a BCG vaccine at birth. Taking a BCG vaccine taking a BCG vaccine at birth. When a baby is born, a baby we call him or we call it an infant. When it is born, at birth, a 
allow me to write it somewhere. The immunization schedule. The immunization schedule that you learned about immunizable diseases. An infant is immunized against this disease at birth. So I have here one under immunization schedule. At birth, the infant is immunized against what we call tuberculosis, is given BCG vaccine, and then the vaccine that is given at birth again is anti polio. Anti polio vaccine, which is used to immunize what we call poliomyelitis or polio. At the age of six weeks, the infant is immunized against. DPT is given a DPT vaccine, distance for diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. It is also known as a triple vaccine. He is also given an anti polio vaccine. At the age of 10 weeks, the infant again is immunized against a disease known as, is given a vaccine called DPT to immunize three diseases and anti polio. I will add another one there. At the age of 14 weeks, the infant is also given DPT vaccine and is given anti-polio vaccine. And then at the age of nine months, you will find the infant will be immunized against two diseases. He will be given the vaccine for yellow fever. He will be immunized this one. He will also be immunized against measles. So in the syllabus that it has been revised recently, you realize that at the age of six weeks, 10 weeks, and 14 weeks, there is a disease that they add there known as hepatitis B. So an infant is also immunized against hepatitis B, hepatitis B like that, hepatitis B. When you come to these nine months, because in the year 2016, the Ministry of Education in conjunction with the Ministry of Health they immunized the learners against a disease known as rubella. So they added there rubella. So rubella is immunized at the age of nine months. So you'll find the best way you want to prevent this tuberculosis is by immunizing anybody, any infant that is born at birth. You give him this vaccine known as BCG vaccine. Number two, we said ways of ways that you can get into contact with this tuberculosis is by living in overcrowded places or the houses that are not well ventilated. So if you want to prevent it, you live in well ventilated places, well ventilated rooms or houses. Number three, I said here the last one, when you drink unboiled milk, you can get tuberculosis. If you want to prevent it, definitely, you are supposed to do what? Boil milk before drinking it. Boil milk before drinking it. Number four, tuberculosis can be also found if you come into contact because it is under hygiene. You are supposed to avoid dusty places. Avoid dusty places places. When there's some places that is a lot, we have a lot of dust, you can avoid it because you can inhale it and maybe it is infected. It has got these bacteria that cause tuberculosis and you'll find yourself getting this one. And then another one, number five, you observe high standards of hygiene. Observing high standards of hygiene. When you talk about hygiene, you are supposed to take good care of your personal effects or personal items. Make sure when you cough, even they have taught us how to cough, we are supposed to use your elbow. Number six, another way of preventing this tuberculosis is by avoid spitting in the streets. Kutema mate, avoid spitting in the streets. Avoid spitting in the streets. When you spit in the streets, maybe you will have what we call this. This, this. this bacteria can be found in your sputum. So when you spit there on that saliva, and then somebody steps on it, or somebody holds it, and then it comes into contact, and then inhale that what? The sputum. You will find that he or she can get this 
tuberculosis. Another way is by sprinkling water onto the earthen floor before sweeping. You sprinkle water on the earthen floor. Earthen floor simply means those that are not cemented. Earthen floor before sweeping. So because there's a lot of dust there, this one justifies this point here. You are supposed to live in a place that you are supposed to avoid dusty places. Dusty places. So before you sweep that place, you make sure you sprinkle some water there. Number eight, another way of preventing tuberculosis is by washing handkerchief with warm, soapy water. Washing handkerchief. with warm, soapy water. It should be warm to remove that saliva or any mucus that is in your handkerchief. Or if you can use it to dry your mouth, some people they use like that, but you're not supposed to use the handkerchief. When you blow your nose and then you wipe it, if you want that mucus to come out of the handkerchief, we use warm, soapy water. And then the number nine I have got, covering nose and mouth when coughing and sneezing. You are supposed to cover, covering the nose and mouth. When you are coughing and sneezing. We have many, many, many ways of doing what? Preventing this tuberculosis. I said one of the places you can get is, it's when you go to a place where, which is overcrowded. So in short form, you can also avoid overcrowded places. But that one does not mean that you cannot go and attend any public function because you avoid contacting tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, you can get it and you can get healed. But there are some just preventive measures. So number 10, I can say avoiding overcrowded places. Overcrowded places. And then the last one I can highlight here. It is by seeking treatment immediately. If you realize that you have got these signs and symptoms for tuberculosis, you can seek treatment immediately to prevent further contact to other people. And obvious will be isolated to another place. You isolate those people that have tuberculosis. It is also another preventive measure. You can see even corona, if somebody has it, somebody is taken away from other people. So that is what we call isolation. You isolate those people that are infected. Isolation of infected people. So if somebody has tuberculosis, he's not supposed to come into contact with other people until he has been vaccinated and the other people are assured that he or she cannot get this disease here. And then my last part for my lesson today, we want to look at examples of TB tests. How can you carry out TB tests? Examples of tuberculosis tests. Examples of this TB test. How can you be tested? And you know that you have tuberculosis or not. We say the surest test for malaria is by blood test. Now tuberculosis, there are three ways you can be tested. One, it is through saliva test. In short, the best way or the surest way to know if you have got this tuberculosis is by using saliva. So this is the surest way. The surest test for tuberculosis is saliva test for TB. When you want to know that you have tuberculosis, you, will, you are supposed to spit somewhere your saliva, and then the doctor will carry out some test, and then they will find out if you have it or not. And they will only do that if they have interrogated you and they have seen that maybe you have got those diseases. And then the other way that they, you can be tested is through skin test. They test your skin. And then number three, it is through x-ray test on the chest. 
x-ray test on the chest. So these are the ways that TB can be tested. And I believe that is where I can end from. I can end my lesson today here. I want to check out some questions that you have sent unto me. I can see, okay. There are some questions that you have sent to me here. Allow me to answer them. The first question here, it says like this, what is mumps? He has not written the name. Mumps are things that they can affect the growth. You can see you can have enlarged what? Cheeks here. That is what we call the mumps. And then somebody is asking, when you cover stagnant water with oil, is in that pollution? It is not pollution because... Uh, Oil spillage occurs only in rivers. It mainly pollutes rivers, does not pollute the soil, and depends on the nature of that water. I believe it is not a lake, and oil spillage mainly occurs in large body masses. My name is Anne. Please give me examples of vegetation cover. And examples of vegetation cover, we have got one. Okay, I believe you are talking about cover crops. So the vegetation cover crops, or you are talking about those vegetation cover I don't know which question you are asking, but the vegetation cover crops that we have in science, cover crops. One, we have got napier grass. Two, we have got even sweet potato, the sweet potato vines. They can be cover crops. Three, we can have this thing known as Grass, the best cover crop that we have in science is grass because it is common in every areas. So we have got many, many, many. Neobadia, what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is the red coloring pigment or the red coloring matter that is found in the red blood cells. Obadia, I believe when you reach in standard seven, you learn about what is hemoglobin. Hello, teacher. I'm Mary from Kitale. The plasmodium that transmits malaria is called the plasmodium parasite that transmits malaria is called so it is called the one that transmits malaria is caused by malaria parasite that parasite now according to a level we call it female anopheles mosquito and, and it is a vector i believe we are together mary so i said it is the female anopheles mosquito that spreads or transmits it I'm Haberstone from Webuye. What is the main prevention of tuberculosis? The main preventive of tuberculosis, it is best prevented through vaccination at birth. The best way of preventing TB, that's why I wrote in red pen here, you are supposed to take a BCG vaccine at birth. So if you want to prevent it, it is mainly by taking what we call vaccination. I believe we are together. Uh, and I believe I can stop there because of time. Have a blessed day.